Anybody here like being in a crisis? No. Uh, those, what, what I call those desperation moments, uh, those moments where financially you're looking at your bank account and everything just seems to be running dry, and then all of a sudden you know how this works, right? The car stops working, something needs to be changed, a bill comes due that you didn't know about, a health issue, and you've got to take a trip to the emergency room with your kids, and you're wondering to yourself, how on earth am I going to pay for this? Maybe it's the moment that comes into your life, and all of a sudden it's like, you know what, that job that you were so dependent upon, they're making some cutbacks, they're laying off people. Maybe you just weren't the right fit, and you got the notice that two weeks and it's all done, or maybe not even two weeks, it's done now. Maybe for some of you, it's the marital circumstance. You've been there. Maybe if you're honest, some of you are still there. That nothing seems to be going right in your marriage, that everything seems to be falling apart, that you're in this situation going, I thought that this was going to work. Maybe you started the new year going, I'm going to start going to church, and if I go to church, Jesus is going to fix my marriage. He's going to make everything right. And actually, really what you were thinking, is, Jesus is going to fix my man, right? He's going to fix all of that problem, and everything's going to be great. And yet, you find yourself in a situation right now where you go, why am I in such desperate crisis? Maybe it's some circumstances with your kids, some details going on in their lives, and you're like, I, I want to fix this, but I, I, I can't, or the decisions that they're about to make, and I'm out of, they're adults now, or all the details, or maybe, maybe for some of us, it's relationships. Something's been going on. It seems to be something that is in a desperate crisis right now, or maybe, maybe for you, it's your health. You went to the doctor. They had some bad news. Hey, I hate to tell you, you've got fill in the blank. Or you just been haven't, haven't been feeling well for th those moments. And here's the truth of the matter. Some of you have walked in through these doors, and you are in a desperate moment today. Some of you, you're coming out of a desperate moment. For the rest of you, you're probably heading into a desperate moment. Aren't you glad you came to church and you got that information? The reality is it's all going to hit us at some time or another. It's how, how life seems to operate. And today I want to spend some time looking at two individuals who found themselves in such desperate moments of their lives, and they came with a desperate faith to Jesus and to see his response, because how he operated back then is very similar to how he's going to operate with us today, and to see what we can learn about what faith really looks like and what God does, what Jesus does when we respond to him in our crisis moments and come to him in faith. And if you're taking notes, I want to encourage you to write this in. Desperation often ignites or reveals our faith in Jesus. Have you ever found that? Desperation can often ignite or reveal your faith in Jesus. Those moments where all of a sudden you go, I have nowhere else to go. Maybe you have been not walking with God. Maybe you have had nothing to do with God, but there are so, so many things going on that you're like, I'm willing to give anything a try. Or maybe you're a follower of Jesus, and it's this moment of, I throw my hands up in the air, God help me, I can't do anything else here. I'm coming to you and I'm asking you to do something incredible in my life. And that is what we find ourselves with these two individuals that we're gonna spend a moment spending some time looking at their experience with Jesus. Now let me give you the backstory of what's been going on in case you haven't been with us. We started Mark chapter one just about a month ago at the beginning of the year. Navigating through a man by the name of John the Baptist who came to prepare the way from the Lord. He's getting people's hearts spiritually ignited and ready to go. Jesus comes and is baptized by John in the Jordan River. And then the Spirit of God descends upon him. A voice from heaven declares, you are my son whom I love. With you I am well pleased. And Jesus is led by the Holy Spirit out in the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. He's fasting there for 40 days. And over the course of the last couple of weeks, we talked that his beginning ministry starts. He calls Calls a couple of guys, Peter, James, John, and Andrew, fishermen, and he says, come and follow me. And then he begins and launches this ministry. Uh, the first moment that we read about is he's in church and a demon-possessed guy stands up and he casts the demon out of the man and, and this man is miraculously healed. Later that day, he goes to Simon's home and his Simon's mother-in-law is there and she's got a fever. Jesus picks her up, get, grabs her and, and, and heals her and she begins to wait on them. And then the whole town is coming. We talked about this last week. Everybody's coming to get their needs met. They're, 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 they're fixed, they're healings. And Jesus, after that whole night, he goes out early in the morning as is his custom and he spends some time in prayer and the disciples come look at him. They say, everybody's looking for you, Jesus. The whole town is ready for you. This is a great opportunity. The ministry has started. And Jesus says, hey, we're gonna go someplace else because that's not what I've come for. I've come to preach the good news. 
And he goes out throughout Galilee. And that's where we find ourselves in Mark chapter 1. And we're going to be starting at verse 40 here. Hopefully you found yourself there and you can follow along with me. It says this, a man with leprosy came to him and begged him on his knees. If you are willing, you can make me clean. Jesus was indignant, yours might say. Jesus was filled with compassion. And he reached out his hand and he touched the man. I am willing, he said, be clean, and immediately the leprosy left him, and he was cleansed. Jesus sent him away at once with a strong warning, see that you don't tell this to anyone, but go show yourself to the priest and offer the sacrifices that Moses commanded for your cleansing as a testimony to them. Instead, he went out and began to talk freely, spreading the news. As a result, Jesus could no longer enter a town openly, but stayed outside in lonely places, yet the people still came to him from everywhere. Would you pray with me this morning, Father, as we spend some time opening up your word and your truth, we confess that we desire for your spirit to move in our hearts, that it would be more than just saying we came to church, but that we genuinely encountered you today. And Father, in this room, I got to believe that there may be some of us who have walked into this place in a crisis. We're desperate, and in a way that only you can, would you speak into hearts and lives this morning? Would you touch us much like you just touched the leper, and that we would walk away not just saying we were with God's people or that we were at the call church, but that we genuinely experienced the power and the presence of the Almighty God who loves us and cares for us, has compassion on us. So Lord, we invite you here to accomplish your purpose. Help us to use this time to the full. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. If you're taking notes, I'd encourage you to to write this down. Desperate faith and Jesus' response to that. I'm gonna spend some time talking about what faith really looks like and we can get this from these individuals. The first is this, faith approaches and asks. Would you say that with me? Faith approaches and it asks. We have this whole idea of a man with leprosy comes to Jesus and begs him on his knees, and if you are willing, you can make me clean. Now, for most of us, we read over this, and we start talking about people with illnesses and sicknesses, and we know that the mute came to Jesus, and the blind came to Jesus. We're going to talk about this in a moment. The paralyzed got to experience the healing power of Jesus, but this is a unique situation. This is a man with leprosy, and leprosy, for most of us, we know it it, it entailed a, a skin disease, but they have said that there were three forms of leprosy. First, there was a nodular or tubular, uh, a, a tubular uh, leprosy, and this disease could begin as an unaccountable sluggishness and pain and pain in the joints. It begins with little specks on the eyelids and on the palms of the hands. Then it begins to spread over the whole body. It bleaches the hair white. It covers the skin with scales and oozing sores. Nodules gather on the cheek, the nose, and the forehead. The whole appearance of the face has changed until the sufferer no longer even appears human. There is a second type, and the initial stages are the same as the first, but in addition, there was a loss of feeling in the extremities. The victim loses all sense of touch and pain, initially in the fingers and the toes, and then spreading up the arm and the legs because of injury and infection. There is a progressive loss of fingers, of toes, and in the end, even loss of a whole hand or a foot. A study was done in a group of lepers, and and what was being noticed is they were losing their fingers, and they were typically losing their toes, and they couldn't figure out how this was happening in the particular area where they were doing this study because all sensitivity and the nerve endings were damaged. Rats were actually coming and eating the toes of these people off, and they could not even feel it. The third, most common of this, was a mix of the two types. It was a terrible fate, and there was no cure, no speedy death, only a slow and torturous death eventually of decay. One author put it this way, leprosy was nothing short of a living death, a corruption of all the horrors, a poisoning of the very spring of life, a disillusion little by little of the whole body so that one limb after the other actually decayed and fell away. It was a death sentence. Back back then they didn't have a cure for this. 
And, and as bad as that sounds, it was really an individual was, it was, it was an only a matter of time. Hey, if you got notified, you had leprosy. And, 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 and the moments, I would encourage you, you can read back over this in Leviticus chapter 13 and Leviticus chapter 14. You can see what the process was for the religious leaders, the priests of the day, to declare that somebody had leprosy. And not only was it that, that, that as you, as you kind of walked around in the disfigurement and all that that entailed, Leviticus 13, 45 through 46 also gives another addition to all of this. It says, anyone with such a defiling disease must wear torn clothes, let their hair be unkept, cover the lower part of their face and cry out, unclean, unclean. It was a warning to anybody that was around them. Every single time they got around a public environment with people who did not have leprosy, they had to let everybody know, this is the situation that I'm in. Stay as far away from me as possible. And as a matter of fact, as long as they have the disease, they remain unclean. They must live alone, and they must live outside of the camp. There was no social life for a leper unless you were socially in a a club with other lepers. It's just how it worked. You were excluded from all religious activity. You were excluded from from going to church. You were excluded from community. You were excluded from touching. And and what we know, not just from Mark's account, but from Luke's account also, and Luke was a doctor, he describes it this way. This man was full of leprosy. This is a guy who's been experiencing this for a very long time. And I wonder, we don't know, was he married? Did he have kids? When's the last time that he talked with them? When's the last time that he had physical touch with somebody that wasn't another leper? And this guy is in a desperate situation, and he comes to Jesus, and he approaches him, and he breaks all the rules. He comes down, and he begs him on his knees, Jesus, and he approaches him, and he asks, if you're willing, you can make me clean. I want you to notice something. Does that sound humble? Help me out this morning. Does that sound humble? Thank you. Okay, this rose with me. All right, this is great. So I don't know about what you guys are doing here, but uh, yes, it's not this demand of Jesus, I want you to do this for me. It's a moment of Jesus, I believe something about you, and that is what actually brought me here in this moment. And I'm going to ask in humility that if you would be willing, I know and believe wholeheartedly that you have the power and the capability to do this in my life. I'm not going to tell you what to do, but I'm going to ask you that. And it reminds me so much of the verse in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6. And without faith, it is impossible to please God, for whoever comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. This guy pursues Jesus, comes to him, begs him, breaks the rules, and I want you to notice Jesus' response. Jesus responds with compassion. Would you say that with me? Jesus responds with compassion. It says, filled with compassion, Jesus reached out his hand, and he touches the man. Yours might say, Jesus was indignant. And, and both, I, I believe, are, are correct. Jesus feels this compassion for this individual who has been experiencing this. And I want to let you know that whatever your circumstances are today, Jesus knows very full well everything that's going on in your life. There's nothing that he misses. And he's not sitting up there frustrated with you, angry with you. He has compassion on you. And he is indignant over what sin has done in the lives of people. It, is, it has impacted this individual's life in a tremendous way. Jesus feels He has compassion on you. And maybe you've walked through these doors today, and honestly, you don't even want to go to God. You don't want to go to to Jesus Christ because you think he's always just angry with you. You grew up in that type of environment where God is just waiting for you, and he's like, I can't wait for you to mess up one more time. Maybe you had a parent figure like that. Maybe when you hear, God is my father, that's the association. And I just want to let you know today, God is not waiting to respond with you to get you. He's waiting to respond with compassion and with love for you. Would you do me a huge favor and turn to somebody next to you and just say, God loves you. Just tell them that. God loves you. And turn to them again and say, God loves me too. Just tell them that. (laughs) And can I say this for some of us in this room, for many of us in this room who would say that we are followers of Jesus Christ? This was an outcast. Jesus could have come up and went, whoa, buddy, get away. Did you catch what he does? He reaches out his hand, and he touches the man. 
which would have made typically Jesus unclean as well. And yet he does it. And I wonder if there's some untouchables in your life today that God is saying, hey, I want you to show compassion to them. You say, well, who could that be, Brian? Well, your neighbor. Somebody that you go, that person drives me bananas. Could it be somebody who has a different political opinion than you do? (laughs) Yeah, for some of you, that's funny. For some of you, you're like, that's not funny at all, Brian. (laughs) Somebody whose lifestyle, morally, is a little different. Somebody in the workplace that you go, their sexuality, I don't even want to have any conversations with them, and I'm wondering if God has put you strategically in their life to say, I'm not trying to get you to boot them out. I'm trying to get you to show them the love of God because you're a follower of Jesus. May we learn a lesson from the life of Christ that how he responds to the outsiders, to the untouchable. And I want to let you know that Jesus does this more than on one occasion. Next week we're going to be talking about this more, so don't miss out on that. The second thing there, if you're taking notes, is this. Jesus responds to our faith, but he asks for our obedience. I want to say that again because this is really important. Jesus responds to our faith, but he asks for our obedience. Jesus reaches out. He touches the man. He says, I am willing to be clean. Boom, immediately. There's no no fancy things. There's no all this. Jesus just does it because he has the power to do this. And then it says this. Jesus sent him away with a strong warning. See that you don't tell this to anybody. Now, that seems weird, right? If you were thinking that Jesus was trying to start his ministry and get recognition, you'd want, tell it to everybody. But Jesus tells this guy, don't tell it to anyone, but go show yourself to the priests and offer the sacrifices that Moses commanded for your cleansing. You can read that in Leviticus chapter 14. It gives the whole process of how this works out, and a priest would declare somebody clean. They could enter back into society. Jesus has cleansed this man. Instead, man, that's a real important word here. Instead, he went out and he began to talk freely, spreading the news. And as a result, Jesus could no longer enter a town openly, but stayed outside in lonely places. Anybody think, what is wrong with that guy? Anybody read that and go, why wouldn't you just do what Jesus asked you to do? All you had to do was not say anything. Go and offer the sacrifices. Go see the priest. This could have been an incredible moment. The priest probably would have been like, what did you, you were the guy that you, you used to have leprosy and now you don't have it anymore. Who did this to you? Oh, it was Jesus of Nazareth. He healed me. This is incredible. It would have been an amazing moment. But instead, did you catch that? Instead, he went out and began to talk freely about it to everybody, such to the point that nobody could get around. Jesus didn't even want to go into public places anymore. He had to hide out because it had a huge impact on his ministry. I read this and I think of this guy, what a jerk. Jesus just did something incredible in your life and you can't do one thing that he asks until I go, oh, do we ever do that? Yeah, Jesus has saved my life. He asked me to do this, but instead, instead I choose to do something different. Jesus responds to his faith, but he asks for his obedience. And I think he asks for ours too. What are your insteads? It's anything that God asks us to do and to live by in the scriptures, right? Yeah, Jesus asks for this in my sexuality. He saved my life. Oh, man, he's changed my life. But he asks for this in my sexuality. I I don't want to do that. I got better ideas. He asks for this in the balance of alcohol and not getting drunk. But you know what? I want to keep doing what I'm doing. He asked me to be honest. He asked me not to lie in my business transactions. He asked me not to gossip and slander people. But you know what? Instead, I just go and do that at the water cooler at the workplace. And can I ask you a question? Have you ever thought that your life and your lack of obedience might have an impact on the ministry that Jesus can have through your life to other people? I'm going to let that pause and sink in for just a moment. This guy went out and shared with everybody what Jesus had did, and now all that they want, they want to come and flock to him to get their lives fixed. And Jesus is saying, I want to transform people's destiny. I want to fix their sin problems, not just their physical ailments, and I wish you wouldn't have gone and done that. And not only that, Maybe it's the obedience things of what we should be doing. 
Hey, get me to that spot where I'm trusting in God and he's called me to serve. So Lord, I'm going to step up and serve in that area and use my gifts to honor you. I don't know what your insteads may be today. But have you ever stopped to think that my insteads of doing what God has called me to do and living how God has called me to live may be the very thing that people go, you call yourself a Christian and that's what a Christian is? I don't want anything to do with that. Now, we're all on a journey, right? Nobody here is perfect. Anybody here perfect? No, nobody. I'll talk to your wife. She'll tell me the truth, right? Nobody here is. We all miss the mark. And some of us, that's our thing, right? Well, I don't want to be a hypocrite, so I'm just totally honest with my imperfections. And you have been a Christian for 30 years, and there's been very little growth in your life. It's time to step up to the plate. And instead of saying instead, saying, God, I'm going to be obedient to you. This is getting really serious right now, so we're going to move to point two. It's uncomfortable. Faith takes action. Would you say that with me? Faith takes action. We see this incredible moment. Jesus heals this guy. And in Mark chapter 2, if you're following along, let's continue with the story. It says, a few days later, when Jesus again entered Capernaum. Now, if you remember this, Capernaum is where Jesus' ministry began. In Simon's household, in his mother-in-law's household. The people heard that he had come home. Everybody's excited. This guy was the guy who was healing everybody, and he's back. And look what happens next. They gathered in such large numbers that there was no room left, not even outside of the door, and he preached the word to them. Remember, this is why Jesus left Capernaum to begin with. He wanted to go because his mission was to preach, not just to heal people. He said, I, I got to go out. I got to share the good news with everybody. So he is preaching. He's teaching. And I wonder what this moment was like. I wonder how many people were hurt. Hey, he's back. The healer guy who left where we couldn't find him that morning. And I wonder if there might have been a couple of guys running to it. Hey, let's get over there. Let's see this guy. Let's listen to him. We know that there were teachers of the law. There were people that, there were, that, that were there that were there to be critical. There were people that were there to examine. Is this Jesus guy really for real? What is he teaching? We're going to get caught up on that. And I wonder if there were people going, we want, our, we want to see him. We want to get healed by him. And I almost imagined a guy or two run into the scene, and maybe one of them saying to himself, hey, you know what, 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 what about Paul? What, what about Paul? Yeah, what about Paul, Paul? You know, Paul, he's paralyzed. And maybe they had even tried to get him to Jesus on that first morning when Jesus left. He said, yeah, I thought about Paul. What do you think? You think we should go get him? Why don't we get him? And these two guys maybe grab two other guys, and we know that there's four of them, and they, they go and grab Paul, and, and, and they're, they're taking him to the, to the household where Jesus is at, and listen to this in verse 3. Some men came bringing to him a paralyzed man carried by four of them, and since they could not get to Jesus because of the crowd, they made an opening in the roof above Jesus by digging through it, and then lowered the mat the man was lying on. There's an incredible moment. I mean, these four guys are carrying. You can almost picture it, right? This guy's on a mat. We don't know exactly why he's paralyzed, but he's paralyzed. He can't move. And these four friends, these four guys who care about them, get to the spot, and the house is packed. I wonder if they're like, hey, excuse us. And people are like, hey, this, the teacher's, he's teaching. What's wrong with you guys? And they're standing there going, we're going to wait, we're going to wait. And I just wonder if maybe paralyzed Paul, which Paul's not his name. I'm just, just to let you know, I'm just going with this. And he's sitting there going, guys, why don't we call it a day? This is embarrassing for me. I don't really want to be here. Everybody's eyes are on me. Let, let's not do this. And finally, one of them's like, well, we'll just wait it out. We'll just wait it out. And Jesus is teaching like a good preacher does. He's just preaching and going for it, right? And maybe one of them goes, you know what? What about the roof? Nobody's up there. And one of the buddies going, nobody's up there because nobody can hear anything up there. He's like, I know, but what if we tear into that thing? It's not our house. All right, excuse us, excuse us, excuse us. And they're working their way up a stairwell to get to the top of a roof. And roofs in that time, not metal roofs. That's not how it was. It wasn't even your Spanish tiles. It's kind of like that. It was mud. A lot of times there was beams and, and, and thatch and, and sticks and mud and mud and then tiles sometimes. And, and roofs were flat back then because people would spend a good portion of their day in the cool, afternoon when the wind would kick up 
these homes, they didn't have air conditioning, no electricity. It would get hot in the house, so they would do a lot of their living up above. And these guys get up there. And can you imagine this scene? I mean, just picture it even if we were here and, 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 and we're teaching. All of a sudden, something starts dropping out of the roof, right? We get distracted. I even get distracted. We get a crying infant, something going on like that. Somebody gets up to go use the restroom, and I'm like, everybody's eyes follow that. So that's why I'm just, you got to go before you get in here, right? So whatever. We get all distracted by all sorts of things. Could you imagine if we were sitting here and all of a sudden I'm talking and boom, this big old chunk of clay just come bang and then sticks are going and dust is flying everywhere and all of a sudden you just see this beam of light coming through and these guys going, hey, pull up some more. We can't get them in. And I know what we have in our mind, right? You've got this four by eight foot section and this guy on a mat and four guys with ropes and they're all just gently letting him down nice and smooth here, right? Probably not how it happened at all. They probably got maybe a two-by-three little hole, and they're pushing Paul through, you know, God, get down there, man. And they got him roped up, and he's spinning around. And then they're like, if we drop him, no big deal. He's paralyzed. It, right? I mean, they're thinking all of this stuff. And Jesus is still teaching, right? And then he lands right in front of him. And I'm wondering if he's just like, dang it, all these people are staring at poor Paul, who maybe didn't even want to be there to begin with. And he's like, what is happening right now? And Jesus does something crazy. It says this in verse 5. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralyzed man, Son, your sins are forgiven. I, 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 I wonder. I wonder if the guys up above are like, what? I wonder if the people sitting there listening to Jesus were like, what? We all know what they're doing here. It's a paralyzed guy who needs to get healed. And Jesus says to him, Son, your sins are forgiven. And I want to tell you that genuine faith takes action. These four guys got to a spot where they said, listen, we may be on the outskirts here. We may be on the outside of all of this, but we're not giving up. We're going to trust that Jesus can do something for our friend, and we're going to do whatever it takes to get him there. We believe that he can, and we're going to take the action to do it. And in verse 5 there, if you're still taking notes, I think the whole point of this is Jesus often responds with what we need rather than what we want. Jesus often responds to what we need rather than what we want. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralyzed man, son, your sins are forgiven. Why would he do that? I believe because Jesus knew that there was a bigger need than what they wanted fixed right there. We don't know exactly why Jesus did that, but it could be that this guy has lived his entire life hearing, you know why you're paralyzed? Because of some behaviors in your life. That's God's punishment for you and your sin. Or could it be that later on in his journey, maybe this was the issue that he started making some decisions Oh, yeah, you remember that night that Paul was up on the rooftop and he was drunk as a skunk and thought it'd be funny to jump off and... He's paralyzed. Remember that day he got caught in adultery? The husband came home, punched him in the chin. He hit his head, cracked his neck, paralyzed. And I wonder if he's been living with the guilt and shame of his situation as standing before God because Jesus knew what he needed more than he knew what he needed. And he says, son, your sins are forgiven and I want to tell you this, that sometimes in our lives, God does not always answer with what we want. It's true. The Apostle Paul prayed that God would take something away from him, and he didn't provide the healing for it. Not every time that we come to God is he going to give us what we're wanting, but he gives us what we need. He does. And for some of us here today, I wonder if our prayers may need to get adjusted just a little bit to say, God, I'm tired of trying to push of what I want. I'm asking you to give me what I really need. And he may be developing your faith. He may be growing your character. He may be positioning you for something down the road that you may never even know of, that if he gave you what you really wanted, you would miss out on that. Do you remember the story of the leper? What does Jesus first do? He reaches out and he touches the man. And I wonder how long it took Jesus before he said, I'm willing to be clean, because he knew what the man needed. God knows what we need even better than we do. Number three here, my faith can powerfully impact others. I don't know if you caught this, but it says, when Jesus saw whose faith? Their faith. Not paralyzed Paul. When he saw the faith of their friends. And I want to let you know today, 
You may have somebody in your life that doesn't have enough faith to follow Jesus, and you praying for them may be the very thing that they need in their lives. You inviting them to church, you sharing your testimony, you loving them through their difficult season. There may be somebody in your life today that I want to encourage you with this, that may be struggling in their faith journey, and you being alongside of them to say, I'm going to pick up your mat, I'm going to go with you through this, we're going to see it through the tough time, I'm going to carry you through, that your faith, maybe just rely on my faith for a season and see what God can do in your life. It might be that God wants to use you in some powerful ways. And I just want to conclude by saying this. I know we're a little long today because of baptisms, but we've asked this question from the very beginning of Mark, who is this Jesus? And at the end of this, this incredible scene takes place. Jesus says to him, your sins are forgiven. And it says in verse 6, now some of the teachers of the law were sitting there thinking to themselves. We know that there's a group of these religious leaders that are watching Jesus, trying to find some holes about him, and now all of a sudden he speaks up and says, your sins are forgiven, and this is what they are thinking. Why does this fellow talk like that? He's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? Nobody has authority to forgive sins except God. And this guy is claiming that? Oh, man, we've got a big issue here. And in verse 8, immediately Jesus knew in his spirit that this is what they were thinking in their hearts. And so he speaks up. He says, why are you thinking these things? Which is easier to say to the paralyzed man? Your sins are forgiven or to say, get up and take your mat and walk? It's obvious, right? What's easiest to say? Your sins are forgiven? Sure, nobody can prove that. I can walk around, hey, your sins are forgiven. Your sins are forgiven. Your sins are forgiven. Your sins are, nobody can prove that. But he says these words, and it's important. But I want you to know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. I want you guys to know this. I tell you, get up and take your mat and go home. Can you imagine the moment? I wonder if paralyzed Paul was just like, okay, gets up, takes that first step, takes another step. The crowd's like, oh my goodness, what has just happened here today? And I bet you after that, he's running through the streets because he hasn't been able to walk for who knows how long. He's moving his arms. He's telling his buddies, hey, guys, fix the skylight, see, uh, you know, whatever's going on there. And he's off and he's running. And then it says this. He got up and he took his mat and he walked out in full view of them all. And this amazed everyone. And they praised God saying, we have never seen anything like this. And they never would again. Because Jesus is altogether unique. He's not like you and me. And if we ask the question, and Mark starts this in chapter 2 just by declaring, who is this Jesus? He is the Son of God who came to forgive our sin. That's who he is. He is the Son of the living God who came to forgive our sin. He is God in the flesh. We as Christians believe this. We go through passages. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. John chapter 1. He took on form as a human being. Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 and following. That our attitude should be like that of Christ Jesus, who being very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but he made himself nothing. Colossians talks about in him, in Jesus Christ, the fullness of deity dwells in bodily form. Jesus is not just a great guy. He's not just a moral teacher. He's not just a prophet. He came to earth and he claimed, I am the son of the living God. I am God in the flesh, and nobody can do the things that I'm doing, including forgiving sins. And so that you will know that I can forgive sins and I can prove that, I tell this man, get up and take Take your mat and go home. And so what does this mean for us today? Because I know for some of you right now, you're like, I'm, I'm not a leper. That's not me. I'm not a paralyzed guy. Oh, all of us are lepers. We've all got this thing that is going to take our life. You want some more encouragement this morning? <laughs> you have an expiration date. We all do. You want more encouraging word? Some of you are getting closer to that than others in this room. That's just the reality. It's a 100% chance that you are going to die. And you say, well, I'm not a leper. Yeah, the leper had a walking death sentence, and you hear it all the time. We're in the land of the living. You are not in the land of the living. We live in the land of the dying. We live in the land of the dying. And until we have that moment, we come to Jesus Christ and we say, if you are willing, you can make me clean. 
Because our eternity, we are separated from God because of our sin. It has destroyed our life. It's destroyed our relationship with God. And some of you are like, well, I'm not paralyzed. Oh, maybe you've come to faith in Jesus Christ, but your sin is still jacking up your life. You haven't let it go. It's, it's left you in a place where you're not even living life to the full any longer. And maybe today is a day of coming to Christ in faith and saying, maybe for the very first time, Lord, I need you in my life because God in his love and in his grace sent his son Jesus Christ to die for your sins, to heal your disease, and not just your physical ailments, not just your marriage, not just your finances. He's not the genie in the sky. That's why Jesus didn't want that guy going out and telling everybody about him because Jesus' goal wasn't to come and say, I want to fix all your problems here on earth. His goal was, I want to come and fix your sin problem so that you can have a relationship with my Father so that we can spend eternity with each other because he loves you and he cares about you and he doesn't want you to miss the mark. The Son of God who came to forgive our sins. I wonder if there may be some of us in here today that like that paralyzed guy. Today, your healing is to get rid of shame, to get rid of guilt, Maybe all the junk that you think people think about you. And to get to a place where it doesn't matter what anybody else thinks anymore to say, God, I'm just coming to you. I don't care what the world thinks about me. And in desperation, I'm calling on you. I'm approaching you. I'm asking you. And today, I'm going to take action. I don't know where you're at today. Some of us here, you're, you're in a desperate situation. And, and maybe God's saying, call on me. Go to him. Exercise that faith. Maybe today you're a Christian, and if you're really honest with yourself, you've been living with a lot of insteads. And today is a day of moving into a different direction. And instead of saying instead, it's I'm going to move in a different direction in my relationship with God. I'm not going to just say I have faith. I'm going to say that I have obedience. For some of us, it's to trust that God's giving you what you need instead of begging him for what you want. And to say, God, I trust you in this season of my life. If you're not showing up, the way that I think. I trust that you know what my needs are. I'm going to follow you through it. For some of us here today, maybe it's your faith that's going to impact the lives of others. Sharing your, your testimony. Inviting somebody to church. Praying for them. And lastly, maybe for some of us here today, maybe it's you in desperation calling upon the name of Jesus for the very first time in your life. To say, man, without him, my life is messed up. I'm living in sin, and I'm experiencing the results of that. And I want to tell you this, that Jesus said it well, that the thief comes only to kill and to steal and to destroy. But Jesus came so that you could have life and that you could have it to the full. My hope is that every single one of you in here has life to the full today, and if you don't, we're going to say a prayer in just a moment that maybe you can begin that journey today for the very first time. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes with me? Father, I thank you for these two individuals, actually more than two. These friends of a, a man who by himself couldn't even get to you. And a leper who had some radical desperate faith to reach out to you. And Jesus, I thank you that your response is one of compassion. It's one to meet us where we're at, to give us what we need, not always what we want. And Lord, in a room like this, I've got to believe that there are some in here today that are in a desperate situation. And Father, I pray that they would, one, respond to you in faith and trust that you're going to respond with compassion. You're going to respond by meeting them where they're at as a loving father. And so, Lord, I pray for all of us in this room that we would be compassionate to those who are the untouchables, the unlovables, the outsiders, Jesus, like you were. Father, for some of us today, that it would be a movement of our faith to really put it into action, not just to keep talking about it. And, Lord, maybe there are some here today, this morning, that for the very first time, it's a day of coming to you to ask for cleansing of their sin. And if you're here right now and you're saying, I'm tired of living with guilt, I'm tired of living with shame, I want to know that I've got a relationship with a God who loves me, that I don't have to feel just awkward around all the time or even thinking about coming to church, but I can have a, a freedom 
that I am right with him. And that comes only through faith in his son, Jesus Christ, and the price that he's paid for you. And if you want to take that step today, much like the individuals in baptism did earlier, I would encourage you to start that journey this morning by saying a simple prayer like this in your heart. You don't have to say it out loud. God, I need you. Like the leper, I need you. Like the paralytic, I need you. Right now, I need your touch. Jesus, I believe you died for me. And I confess my sin to you. And I ask you to forgive me of that. Give me a brand new start. Help me to realize all that I have been given in you. No more shame. No more guilt. But just freedom. So thanks for loving me more than I will ever know. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.